Hi, everyone. Welcome to the TimingResearch.com Analyze Your Trade, episode number 147 for January 26, 2021. My name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of TimingResearch.com. And uh, today I've arranged for Carly Gardner of DeCarlyTrading.com to join us again. And uh, you should be seeing her screen right now and her chart. And uh, so she's going to share her thoughts about the market and, uh, and what's going on. And uh, of course, uh, Jim, the option professor, is back as moderator. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Sure. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, for being here. We're going to cover a lot of the uh, stock indexes and uh, the commodities here today. So uh, please sit back and enjoy. There's a lot of things to talk about. Uh, before we get started, could you give a little bit of a background on yourself and also the, uh, the company and uh, what you guys are up to? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So my name is Carly Garner. Um, Sorry, just so you can hear me cor correct? Just yep, making sure. sure I can hear you okay. fine. Great. All right, making sure Great. we're all set. Okay. Thanks, Carly. Apologize. All right. So my name is Carly Garner. I am a futures and options broker. We run a, a kind of a boutique brokerage shop in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, so we handle futures and options on futures. We also put out a lot of educational content because I've learned that uh, the better the best client is an educated client because he or she knows exactly what he's getting into, understands the risks. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, if, you, if you do have any questions or if there's anything that we can do for you or you're interested in just learning more, DeCarly Trading is the website. It's D-E-C-A-R-L-E-Y trading.com. Uh, we're also on social media, Facebook, Twitter. If you just search for Carly Garner or, or DeCarly Trading, we should come up. Great. And uh, again, there's a lot of um, uh, opinions out there that uh, we have kind of a structural bull market in the commodity sector, which has already mm -hmm. begun, and also that inflation may be coming back. And so this area of investment, which is very underutilized in many people's portfolio, might be worthwhile for people to keep uh, an eye on uh, because the opportunity here could be uh, uh, have a pretty good runway. Sure. The great thing about commodities is there's always opportunities. Even if you miss the boat, something else will come along. So that's that's absolutely true. And you're right. The big story right now is um, commodity bull market. We've come off of multi-year lows in most commodities. The weaker dollars really propelled some of the markets probably beyond uh, what fundamentals would justify. But I think we could say the same thing in stock. So nothing new yeah. there. It's uh, the massive liquidity that's been created worldwide has taken sure. anything uh, that's made out of anything uh, higher, it <laughs> seems like, you know. Uh, yes, at any rate, let's go through um, some of the different sectors. And uh, many people are familiar with stocks. So to get them all warmed up, why don't we start with the S&P 500 and get an sure. idea of what you're thinking there. We obviously have uh, tried to go up a number of times here, but it also isn't going down. So you're kind of sure. tough because it's hard to be bearish without it breaking down. And right. it's nervous to be bullish because it's so advanced. So how do you play something that seems like it's too advanced but won't go down? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the way that, that I'm looking at it, and to be honest, I, I didn't quite see it getting quite, you know, as high as it, it's gotten. Our, our target was about 37.50, and we'd had, we made that target in March. Everything, everybody thought we were completely nuts. I'm not saying that um, we're geniuses, we, but it just, that was the chart pattern we were looking at, and it, it did happen to get there. So the chart didn't lie, but it's definitely, uh, I underestimated the, the strength of it. I thought that we'd, we'd uh, run out of steam before now. With that said, I remember feeling this way in early 2018, right about the same time, and also uh, 2019, right around the same time. Something happens often when we split from January to February in the markets. It seems to be the, any holiday rally that we get gets overextended in January. And then come February, there tends to be pretty decent sized sell off. So I'm wondering, I mean, maybe it won't be February 1st. Maybe it won't be, you know, uh, February 5th even. But at some point between now and sooner rather than later, like the next several weeks, I think there's a pretty good chance we get a, a nice deep correction. So our view is it's probably time to focus on keeping what you have as opposed to being aggressive and trying to get more. That's just my thought. I could be wrong, but it, it feels really frothy to me. Um, this is a chart that we've kind of been watching for quite a while. This is a monthly chart of the S&P. So it's taking a really big step back. A few interesting things on this chart is um, we've been 
putting in this megaphone pattern here, we're up above resistance, which is not uh, totally out of the ordinary. It does happen. It, and even just a simple break of resistance doesn't guarantee the market's going to continue to to skyrocket higher without any pullbacks. In fact, a lot of times these types of moves tend to be false breakouts. So for now, that's kind of how we're treating it. That doesn't mean we can't go a little higher. I'll show you a daily chart in a minute. Um, but one thing that I'm watching that's very interesting is the divergence. You can see that mm -hmm. while the S&P is making higher highs, the RSI is not. Now this doesn't mean that's it sell everything, the market's going to crash. No, it doesn't. But it does mean that there's definitely something's not quite right. And so we should at least pay attention to that. We've seen divergence like this a few times. Um, back here in 2008. And again, I don't think we're going to get a 2008 style sell off, but it's just a, a warning that these are really good times. I hope everybody enjoyed the ride, but it doesn't mean they're going to continue. So just be aware. Uh, our on a daily chart, let's zoom in here. I tend to think the market has a pretty good shot at top or topping out. I'm not saying forever. When I say top out, I, keep in mind I'm a futures broker, so we work on short time frames. So we're not talking years, we're talking weeks and months when I say things like that. Um, I'm thinking somewhere around 38.60 to 38.90 is probably where the market's got a pretty good shot at running into some resistance. And then a normal back and fill would put us right around here, which is like 36.30. That's not, that's nothing. That's, we were just there a few weeks ago. But um, if we break that level, I think we could get something quite a bit deeper. And that would put us maybe somewhere in the 3,400 area, maybe maybe even 31, 32 isn't out of the question and we get a, re, a full retest of that. I wouldn't be shocked to see that. I would love to see that because I've lightened up on my investment portfolios and I'd love to be able to, to put something on down there, but maybe it won't happen. We'll see. Mm -hmm. It could be a scenario similar to when the financials came out with their earnings and their earnings were extremely good, yet they mm -hmm. sold off. In other words, uh, the JP Morgan's in the 140s is now in the 130s and Sure. The Citigroup was pushing 70 and now it's pushing the other way. So mm -hmm. it could be a situation where they come out with some good reports here starting tomorrow, uh, but the market uh, may not uh, actually go up like people would expect. And uh, mm -hmm. it could be a, a buy the rumor, sell the fact. Could that be happening? I am so glad that you brought that up. Uh, yes, absolutely. In fact, I've noticed that that happens more often than not. If a market's extended to the upside like it is now, it's really hard for earnings season to hold it up because not only do the earnings have to beat, but the market's already pricing in meets or beats usually. So it has to beat it pretty significantly to impress the market. So a lot of times it's hard for these rallies to hold as we get into the later part of earnings season. Um, we see the flip the flip of that when markets are in a trough. So like if, if the market is in the middle of a correction and it's uh, relatively cheap, then earnings season tends to have the opposite effect. It, sometimes it saves the market. But in this particular situation, I think it will weigh on prices. So I think you're right. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting anyway, because uh, mm -hmm. the financial certainly couldn't have had better reports. And uh, anyone who bought um, anywhere near that time frame um, has nothing to show for it currently. Correct. You know? Right. And yep. Apple, Apple, uh, you know, is up at the 145 area, broke above 139, 38, and uh, some people think it might hit the 150 level. But it'll be interesting to see if it uh, if it holds its gains uh, a week right. or so after uh, these announcements that they're going to come out with, I guess, tomorrow. Correct. And the interesting thing to me is just the the sheer. Uh, speculation that we're seeing coming into some of these tech stocks, especially some of the cheaper ones that smaller retail traders can can easily get into and over leverage mm -hmm. themselves into. For example, I mean, obviously everyone's talking about GameStop and uh, those sorts of situations. But we all know how leverage works. That from what I can see, um, these, uh, there's a lot of traders buying deep out of the money call options or even you know near the money call options because to maximize the leverage and it's worked for them. And I'm, I'm happy for them. Honestly, I'm a little bit jealous to be honest, because I, I didn't participate in, in any of that fun stuff, but uh, we all know that leverage is a double-edged sword. And so these types of stories that we're hearing and people, I don't know if anyone follows TikTok, but I've posted a few examples on my Twitter feed, if anyone's interested, 
there's this entire there's this community of uh, really young traders on TikTok that post videos about how there's no need for anybody to ever work again because you can make all the money you need in the stock market uh, by simply these you know following these simple rules. For example, one one kid's description of his trading strategy was when the stock starts to go up, I buy call options. And then when it starts to go down, I just sell them. And he's paying his bills that way. And so um, when I start hearing these kinds of stories, it really makes me think that the risk is eventually going to be, when I say eventually, I mean probably sooner rather than later, going to be to the downside. This is a chart of the NASDAQ futures, and I know everybody's aware of how big of a run we've had, but this just kind of puts things in perspective. From the March low to now, we've basically had a roughly 7,000 point move. The prior rally took us 10 years to cover that amount of space, and we've done it in 10 months. So it's really been incredible. And it must uh, be linked to the liquidity factor because uh, there's sure. there's just a uh, hard to, in other words, even, uh, the Macy's and the Dillard's and the uh, uh, Nordstrom's that have just mm -hmm. been going nuts since Monday. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, there has to be, it has to just be a situation of massive liquidity. And then of course, short covering. Mm -hmm. Of course. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it's interesting. A lot of the, the market participants now that are driving some of these stocks up there, they could care less about fundamentals. That's not their game. They're literally just looking at the heat map and whatever's on the top of the heat map <laughs> they mm -hmm. buy and it just kind of propels itself. So it's really interesting to see. Um, and it, in an interesting way, it exposes the financial markets for, um, for really what they are. They don't have to follow the rules. Equations don't mean anything. What you learned in finance class means absolutely nothing. It's all about how many buyers and sellers you have. Yeah, it, it, it's divorced from the economics of it all. Um, yeah. As far as uh, the Russell uh, 2000, that went nuts as well. And um, is that going to be able to hold its gains from your charting and information, do you think? or? Uh, so the Russell's really interesting. To be honest, the, the charting methods that we use work pretty good on the S&P. It does not work on the Russell for whatever reason. The Russell's just kind of a different animal. Uh, so I, I don't, I'm not as... Um, I don't have as much conviction making any type of guess in the Russell than I do as I do yeah. the S and P or anything else. But I mean, one thing that I look at a lot is RSI. If you notice on a weekly chart, the RSI is kind of off the charts. That's a red flag. That's not a guarantee. Anything is going to fall apart, but you can see over the last uh, couple of years, we've never really seen anything quite like this in the Russell. Um, we've got one thing I will, will point out with that is the Russell tends to be highly core. Well, Crude oil and stocks in general, even if we're talking about the S&P, are very highly correlated. The there, I ran the numbers just before I got on today, and um, it was roughly like 90% of the time, oil and the S&P settle in the same direction. So there's a huge correlation there, but it's even more profound in the in the Russell because a lot of these small cap stocks are tied to the energy sector. Mm -hmm. And with crude oil dragging higher, it's it's helping the Russell out. Also, there's a lot of speculation going on in the crude oil stocks, or at least there was. I think a little bit of it's come out in the last week or so. But the point I'm trying to make is crude oil, to me, feels really expensive at mm -hmm. above 50 if you look at fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can pull this up here. And you got you got a number of countries that are dying to pump because they need the money, right? Right. So, yeah, there's all kinds of things going on. This is the uh, the weekly ending stocks, excluding SPR of crude oil. And you can see we're almost, we're not quite, but we're almost at near record uh, supply in crude oil. And in the meantime, we've got some rigs coming back online. The Baker Hughes rig count is going up a little bit. Now we are running into some political um, headwinds. So that's mm -hmm. going to be interesting. But I do think really all of the bullishness is probably priced into crude oil. And I think it's going to be really hard for it to break above 55. And the only reason I bring that up at this particular point is if crude oil does sell off, the Russell's really going to have a hard time with that. In fact, the stock market in general will have a hard time with that. But the Russell in, uh, in particular, I mean, in, uh, I'm not saying we're going back down to 1300 in the Russell, but it, it wouldn't be impossible. I mean, I've yeah, seen on the, crazy on the, things. On the cash, Russell, the 2200 mark, which is about the high, 
Mm -hmm. They've tried to bring it up to that level a number of times. Even today it was at 2183 and it went home at 2149. So right. it, uh, yeah. you know, the technical indicators clearly are, um, are um, extended and, sure. uh, and the prices are showing some difficulty at 2200. So that's, uh, mm -hmm. so. you know, one thing I think would be helpful to people um, is that there are three size contracts on the stock indexes. Uh, one mm -hmm. is like a regular contract. The other one's called a E-mini and the other right. one is called a micro. Okay. Um, obviously, leverage is a two-way uh, um, sword, and some mm -hmm. people may want to um, put their toe in this stuff and maybe use some of the smaller contracts until they find out if you know how they're doing if they don't want to do sure. paper trading. Yeah. Um, so, can you explain the difference in the three different size contracts? Let's say on the S and P. Mm -hmm. So the full size S and P only trades open outcry in a pit, and honestly, it's kind of a ghost town. Nobody trades it anymore. So. I'll, I'll tell you that it's worth $250 per point in the S&P, but that's all you need to know. So just skip that one. I wouldn't recommend, even my bigger traders, I don't recommend it. It's just, it's but not just as, uh, just as an example, if yeah. the S&P right now were to be at 3,800 uh, and uh -huh. it went to 3,700, that means that that contract would change how much in dollar terms? Okay, so if it moved a hundred points, yeah, uh, that would make or lose twenty five thousand dollars per one okay. contract. So, so that gives you the idea of the leverage. Yep. So it's mm -hmm. a it, so the twenty five thousand dollar move on one contract, but the margin is roughly. Um, I mean, I haven't checked it for a while, but it should be about sixty five thousand. I'm just multiplying from the mini, so you'd basically be re, uh, holding. Well, you'd be required to hold $65,000 in your account to trade that. That's a little too hefty for most speculators. So most people go. are trading either the mini or the micro. The micro is a new product. It's just been, the futures have been around about a year, a little over a year. The options have only been around a handful of months, but they're fabulous. So the mini contract is five. Uh, I'm, I apologize. The mini contract is $50 per point. It's been a long day, $50 mm -hmm. per point. So if the S&P goes from 3,800 to 3,700, that's a hundred points and you made or lost uh, $5,000. And the margin requirement on that one? The margin requirement right now is about 13,000. Now, if you would have asked me this a year ago, the margin requirement was like four or 5,000. So it's mm. changed a lot just because the market's uh, been so volatile this year. Mm -hmm. At one point it was around 16, 17,000. So it's come down a little bit, the margin's still high. But actually that sounds high, but if you think about it, it's not so bad. If you're with the uh, S&P here at this value, one S&P futures contract, one E-mini, we're talking about the mini now, represents roughly $190,000 worth of stock. So if you put up $13,000 in margin, you're actually making or losing money based on $190,000 worth of stock. So that's still plenty of leverage. That's a lot of leverage, sure. What's the maintenance on the thirteen thousand? Uh, it's about twelve ish. Oh, so it's very close. Yeah. It's close, yeah. The it's, it, it's it not sounds, a big sounds like they kind of want you to have thirteen thousand in there pretty much all the yes. time. Correct, right? And the way that they uh, they pick these numbers, it's not really arbitrary. Their machines and their computers tell them roughly how much they think the maximum move would be in a single trading session, and that's mm -hmm. where they come up with the margin. So honestly, I encourage people to over margin, like um, reduce leverage by overfunding their account. Mm -hmm. So if they were trading, if they wanted to reduce all the leverage or eliminate all the leverage in that position, they would trade one mini S&P in a $190,000 account. Now that's not going to be too exciting for most people. And that's not what they're trying to do with futures, but that's just to give you an example of how it would work. Yeah. So the micros, with the micros, you can efficiently eliminate leverage in a in a much more reasonable manner so the micro is one tenth the size of the mini so in, instead of making or losing fifty dollars per point you're only making or losing five dollars per point and that doesn't sound like much in fact some people think it sounds like a waste of time but when you look at how much the s p moves it's actually you can actually if you catch a ride you can pick up some uh some money it without very much stress because th with that contract with the micro you're trading roughly $19,000 worth of S&P stock for a margin deposit of only about $1,300. One thing to note is, uh, say you were a believer in what some people are uh, saying, is that 3,900 to 4,000 would be the 
highest we would see before a correction, mm -hmm. and the correction could take you down towards uh, 3,500. Sure. You could use the micros as an accumulating dollar cost averaging vehicle and then use the 4,000 uh, point as a um, scream uncle. Yes, and, correct. Uh, and then if you got to move down from 3,800 to 3,500, uh, that would be a 1,500 point move on each contract if correct. you had your positions above there. So it might be a vehicle for people who think, you know what, I think there will be a correction coming. I think a uh, decent line in the sand might be 4,000. Mm -hmm. And um, rather than putting it all on at one point, you know, use the uh, dollar cost averaging mentality. Right. And I, I, I try to remind people when you're trading the micro, you're um, basically your, I don't want to say your total risk because there's no, you, there's really no limit to your risk when you sell off futures, even in the micro, no, no. who knows? No, there's not. But, no, there's not. But with that said, um, you're probably, even if it goes horribly wrong, you're probably going to lose hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars. So, and that's a big difference, especially, um, you know, for smaller traders and from a mental standpoint. So you're right. You can dollar cost average. Like if you sold one at, let's say you sold one at 3,800 with the assumption that it's going to top between here and 4,000. If you sold one at 3,800 and it got to 39, you'd be down $500. Not probably not the end of the world, not going to ruin your life. You might be comfortable adding another one. You know, you sell another one, and that way your average is 30, uh, 38.50. And then you could do it again at 4,000 if it gets there. And you're right, you, it's basically a uh, lower stress way to play the downside. And if you, if you happen to catch it right, you can increase or, well, improve your entry price, and you can do the same thing on the way down by scaling out. So it's a really great product. Yeah, well, it reduces the leverage. And obviously, sure. from the standpoint of being able to hold a position, uh, that's easier to do with less leverage. You know? It is. I don't know if you can see this. I was going to do it on a micro chart, but I have it all marked up. But this is like a dollar calculator. So this, this is a S&P mini chart, which seems very tame, correct? But if you actually look at it in a dollar point of view, this move from this low a couple of weeks ago to now is like, Ten, eleven thousand dollars per mini contract. So again, if you're if you're on the right side of it, obviously that's great. But that's just a lot of leverage and a lot of PL uh, volatility that for the average speculator, I think. So yeah. the micro is really a, a really good fit for most people. Yeah. No, that's very interesting, and it's very um, good that somebody like yourself could explain it to the layperson. Because you know, um, five hundred dollars for every hundred points is a lot easier to sleep with than five thousand or twenty-five thousand. Absolutely correct. Because, yeah. you yeah. know, dollar, uh, what do you call it? money management and uh, managing your losses and that kind of thing is obviously a big part of any type of trading, futures mm -hmm. or, or stock trading. Right. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Well, let's go to uh, another uh, sector, which, uh, you know, seems to be on other people's mind is the, the metals. Uh, okay. gold, gold, silver, and sure. copper. Okay. So, um, I've got some lingering stuff. Let me just delete all this. The February contract in gold is actually going off the board, but I'm still charting it just because that's kind of the, gives me the most information. But this is a weekly chart in gold. So we can see that while we had that huge run up earlier this year, things have kind of calmed down. The speculation has run out of it. This is actually a, a really good healthy correction, which I think was needed. Um, I'm not... 100% convinced that it's over simply because I tend to be bullish that the US dollar and I know that's not a popular stance to take, but I do think the dollar is probably going to recover just simply because um, we have our issues, but we also are going to, well, currently we're winning at the interest rate differential and other countries probably have bigger issues than we have, which is hard to believe sometimes, but that's probably true. Um, so I do think the dollar will make a comeback. And if that's true, it'll be really hard for gold and silver to go up. That said, this has been kind of a weird year. The correlation between gold and the U.S. dollar isn't really as strong as it usually is. Usually it's a pretty um, pretty accurate negative correlation. And this year it's kind of been hit or miss. So maybe gold and the dollar can actually go up together. That's not entirely impossible, especially if something weird happens. I'm obviously we're probably not going to get another... Um, coronavirus type event like that to that magnitude. But if, any, if anything um, kind of sparks the interest of traders and, in, you know, going risk off, 
that'll send some money to the US dollar and maybe even the metals in together. So it's a little bit complicated and there's a lot of weird mixed signals going on in the metals. Um, all I'm saying is I'm not necessarily bearish. I just think there is room for the market to drop quite a bit further because gold is really famous for huge corrections. And while people that are long gold feel like this is a huge correction, it's really a drop in the bucket compared to what we've uh, what we've seen in the past. So just be careful. And your, your, your longer term moving averages are still substantially under current values. And mm -hmm. that's something that's been a problem for gold because it ran up to 2100 so fast that right. it, you know, that uh, the uh, <clears throat> sentiment went off the board, the prices went off the board. Right. And yeah. uh, the most logical thing is uh, consolidation and pullback. And that continues mm -hmm. today, right? It does. And, and prices have been really heavy. And, and the interesting thing is all the, um, wild speculation that we normally see in gold and we did see earlier this year has kind of moved into other assets like bitcoin so i think bitcoin has taken some of the luster out of gold um we've seen it in tesla and other stocks but gold has just kind of been left behind a little bit when it comes to that uh, that speculative buying so it'll be interesting to see i would love to see a pullback to 1575 because i think that would be a place people could you know maybe be comfortably bullish i'm not sure we'll get it but that would that's kind of a level i'm looking at we've traded sideways for four months so it's hard to say which way it breaks but yeah i was looking at a one uh, one year moving average that was kind of coming in at around 1775 which was around the lows of mm -hmm. the pullback uh, and then we've had a pretty good bounce to 1950, but it mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be able to get through 1950 very well. Right. And then uh, do you think the 1775 ultimately might be vulnerable in the next month or so? Um, I think so. I think that um, if, it, if we do break like 1760, 1775, I think we get a pretty big, a pretty big rundown. Um, I'm just trying to see what these levels are here. So in that last chart we were looking at, just to kind of, the, the last chart was a monthly, this is a weekly. So if we saw 1575, it would be all the way down here, which um, I is, I mean, that's not impossible. That's just the way gold is. If you notice when we peaked out at 1760 uh, last year or earlier this year, I guess it was, we, we saw some pretty decent sized pullback. So this really 1575 would not be impossible. I'm not saying it's gonna happen. I'm just saying if you are, if you do have upside gold exposure, just make sure that you're not, you don't, you have some sort of hedge on or you're prepared for something. Because if we do break below 1760, it could get ugly. Yeah, the gold and politics have something in common in that people get very emotional about it. So they if, if, if they are very much um, believers mm -hmm. in the metals, you know, obviously it would not be a situation where they'd be uh, too keen on hearing anything that wasn't constructive. Long term, right. I think everyone would agree that the long term trends, you know, did turn up in the 14, 1500 area. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the long term trend still looks good. It's just that sure. it could get uh, a little bit more bouncy in the first half of the year. Maybe the second half right. is where it might shine, right? Yeah, I think that sounds realistic. And the thing to keep in mind about these sort of speculative markets is they tend to see washouts when people get really comfortable. And so that you just have to be on your toes and ready for that. One thing that one strategy we've had some luck with over the last handful of months, several months, and we only in our bigger, like uh, the clients that have plenty of margin where I'm not talking about doing this in a small account, but the metals options have been really wildly overpriced ever since this mm -hmm. big run up here. And so we've had some success just selling strangles way out of the money on both sides and, and letting them erode. I'm thinking probably in the next month or so, we'll probably start encouraging people not to do that because we're starting to get to a situation where the, some of the froth has been taken out of the option market and maybe there's, it's a little more risk than reward in the next, you know, as we get into the next roll or so, but and the longer a strategy works, the more right. uh, likely you're getting closer to it not working, not further exactly. away. You're exactly right. Yes. Yeah. One day, so the piper has to be paid. Yeah. Um, how about silver? That seems to be holding okay. above this 24 number, which I thought was important, but it, it can't get above the 28 number, which I think is important. Right. Uh, silver is literally just as neutral as you can get at 25. I mean, I, I feel like there's yeah. no... 
edge either way. Um, so I, we, we're doing kind of, we've kind of encouraged some of our bigger clients to do the same thing here. We're selling strangles, but we're also at the same point where uh, it's been so quiet for so long that even though the options are still a little overpriced historically, they're probably, we're probably going to see a big move one way or the other. Um, so you don't want to have too much naked option risk out there. That's for sure. Cause when silver moves, it moves pretty wildly. When you have, um, like say you had a few contracts of the gold and then you sold a few calls against it in mm -hmm. what one would think is a type of a covered call situation. Sure. Are there a, mar a margin requirements adjusted down or do they treat them as just naked options? No, actually that's a great strategy. And we do have, um, a client that was that's bullish gold but wanted to have a hedge we did help them this week uh actually a couple of people did this similar thing where we went long gold futures and then mm -hmm. sold calls against it i want i it was the june future we purchased and let me just look at the premium here i want to say it was the 1840 but let me check No, actually, I take it back. It was the April. Okay, I apologize. April futures. So we, uh, they went long April futures and then sold the 1840 calls. So a couple things to keep in mind. The exchange gives you a margin break on this. Um, they don't charge you the full margin. I want to say, let me check something real quick here. Oops, I didn't mean to do it that way. Sorry if you saw my Twitter feed. I'm just pulling up the margin sheet here. They've changed the margin so often in these futures, sometimes it's hard to keep up. Okay, so gold futures margin is 11,000 right now. So I believe on this spread, they charged about 6,000. So cuts the margin in half. Now you might ask, why would you sell an at the money call against your long futures? Because we they were going long futures around, if I recall right, somewhere around 1830, somewhere in there and then selling a slightly out of the money call. The reason you might do that is you still get all the upside, not the all the upside, That's that was the exact wrong word to use. You still get some upside potential, at least $55. So let's assume that we were putting this trade on right now. Um, we'll assume we can buy gold at 1840. So if you buy gold futures at 1840, and you sell the 1840 call, it's really the same thing as selling an 1840 put. The reason we tend to uh, prefer to do it this way is if something really weird happens, it's a lot easier to unwind the future than it might be uh, on the put or, or vice versa. Honestly, you could just sell the put if you prefer to do it that way. But either way, the idea is if you're not wrong by in gold, like if gold is exactly at 1840 at expiration in 57 days, you keep the money. So you'd keep like over five grand, somewhere around 5,500 based on these prices. And you only have to be right in gold by $1 or one tick. If you went long a future, you'd have to be right by $50 to get your $55 in premium. So to make five grand on the futures, you'd have to be right by 50 points. If you sell the put or buy the future and sell the call, you literally don't have to be right by more than really anything. If it's the market's exactly where it is, where you enter, just keep your five grand. And that five grand gives you a risk buffer down below. So if, assuming that you collected 5,000, you'd basically break even at 1790. So even if you were wrong by $50 at expiration, you still break even. And when you're talking about selling the put, are you talking about shorting the market and then selling a put? So it's kind of in the same, same kind of a covered deal or? Uh, no, so I, I think I probably shouldn't have even mentioned that, but um, I, it's a little confusing. So they're the same strategy. It's basically a premium collection strategy. So there's two ways to do almost the exact same payout and, and risk reward. So you could buy the future and sell an at the money call, or you could just sell an at the money put. And they kind of do the same thing. Um, I prefer having the future because if the market makes a really big run up, Sometimes, a lot of times the future will outpace the short call and you might be a little better off, but it's in theory, like if you did both, either strategy and you held expiration, the payout would be exactly the same. So some people, uh, like on Twitter, I've been yelled at for and accused of trying to run up commissions because I'm telling people to buy yeah. the future and sell the call. As a, but there actually is a good reason to do it. But it's really this, if you held the expiration, it would have the exact same payout diagram. And if you and if you sold a straddle on it, 
you'd mm-hmm. get about 95 bucks and that would give yep. you um, a uh, sure. 95 buck up or down window, which would be pretty significant. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. See, and this is exactly why we've been doing a lot of um, option strangles. I mean, if you wanted to play it a little differently, like you could sell, um, let's say like a 1950 call for, for $18, that's $1,800. And then turn around and sell the put for like a 1750 for about $1,300. So, um, what is that like $3,300 somewhere in there, Mm $3,200 that you're Uh collecting. The margin on something like that would probably be about 2,500. But I mean, that's, that gives your, basically you make money if gold's between 1950 and 1750 in, in less than two months. So that's, that's not too bad of odds. Now it can get a little scary and hairy sometimes. So yeah. You, I mean, obviously if you get everybody. a two or three, yeah, if you got a two or yeah. 300 point move, then obviously right. the, or the, the mathematics don't work very good. No, um, exactly. With it's not for everybody. To, yeah, no, not at all. Uh, with regards to uh, the guy starting out, uh, what about mm-hmm. the smaller contracts on gold and silver? Can you get an idea on what the margin sure. requirement is on those and, and how much per point it is? Yep. Kind of yeah. So here's the crazy thing about the metals. So one thing to keep in mind, if you're going to trade options, there are only options written against the full size metal. So there are no mini or micro options. So that's kind of a bummer. Oh, okay. But there are several mini and micro gold and silver contracts and it gets a little overwhelming. Uh, the original mini metals, gold and silver traded on the uh, New York Board of Trade, which was bought out by ICE and so on and so forth. And it's kind of just slowly died. The CME created its own version of minis and micros. So I recommend that if you're going to trade mini and micro gold, make sure you're trading the CME versions, not the ICE version. So just so you know, the the ICE version is symbol ZG or ZYG or YI. If you traded 10 years ago, those would be the only symbols you'd even care about, but don't do it anymore. Leave those alone. Go to the uh, CME products. They're more liquid. They're you don't have to pay separately for data fees. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why. Anyway, so there are multiple mini contracts, which makes it really confusing. There's a micro gold, which is 10 ounces. In other words, it's ten, one tenth the size of the full size gold. So mm-hmm. if you're trading gold futures, the full size, you're trading 100 ounces of gold and you're making or losing money uh, based on 100. For every dollar gold moves, you make or lose $100. If you're trading the micro gold, you're making or losing $10 for every dollar gold moves. So that's a lot more manageable for most people. Mm -hmm. Um, But that says Comex and you're saying you want uh, Chicago. Comex is a division of the Chicago Mercantile or oh. Chicago Mercantile Exchange Group. Yeah, it's so okay, confusing. Okay, so Comex and uh, and Chicago are now together. Yes, it used yes. to be uh, New York is Comex, and then Chicago Correct. is Board of Trade or the Merc. Yep, I know they've they've all uh, consolidated, so it's really confusing. But okay. basically, it's now and there's really only two futures exchanges now in the U.S. and it's ICE and CME. CME owns everything else. Right. So this would be the the micro on the uh, gold and uh, mm-hmm. the micro the on micro. the silver is the 1000 ounces. The um, silver. Yeah, there's really not a micro per se on silver. Right. There's a 1000 ounce silver, which is mm-hmm. um, one fifth the size of the regular size silver. And mm-hmm. then there's a mini silver, which it really isn't that many. If you notice, it's it's only half the full size so that it's still 7000 at margin 7700, which is pretty hefty. So I'd say most people, if you're looking for a mini size contract, trade the thousand ounce silver. Yeah. That'll be a little more manageable. But even that has a margin of three over three thousand. So it's um, unfortunately there's no safe way to play silver. It just is what it is. If you wanted to trade the full size, it's fifteen thousand at margin. That one's down here. Similar to the uh, micro on the S and P, it's mm-hmm. uh, the gold is a vehicle again where you could dollar cost average and. Uh, give the market a little bit of room to move on your idea. And because correct. the leverage isn't that tremendous, uh, it wouldn't be as painful. That is correct. So like um, if you were trading a micro in gold and you were wrong by $100. So in other words, it went from 1800 to 1900 and you were short, you were wrong, you'd lose a thousand bucks. So that's, that's a little, quite a bit more manageable than 
what it would be if you were trading the full size contract, which yeah. which would be ten times that amount. So. Yeah, it helps uh, put it a little bit more of a cap yep. on the risk because the leverage is not as much. Correct. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, are you looking at anything with the, the copper? Uh, I am. So here's <clears throat> what we've been looking at in copper. I honestly, I thought copper was going to hold the 330 area because that's kind of what it had done in the past. And it did not. It blew through that and just kept going. So I'm on the fence here. I think that copper might um kind of try to test this 394 dollar area i'm it's going to be really interesting to see if it does i i long term i'm bearish copper i don't think it's going to be able to hold up here at least without a good correction but the issue is the seasonal top isn't for uh another handful of weeks right. and i mean the, usually copper tends to test the the extremes i mean we can see that even when it's selling off it does that so it'd be it would be unrare it would be rare for the market not to come up and test some sort of resistance up. Try to hit that four at, number, maybe. Right. Here's a monthly chart, which is um, probably a little more convincing on the bearish side. So it'll be interesting, but yeah, I still think four dollars might might want to get touched first. So psychological we'll price. Yeah. Number. We'll see. I don't know. It's a, it's a tough market to trade. Copper is really, the options have gotten so much better in recent years, but it's still a tough market to, to trade. Um, I'm sorry. I have to take this. Hold on one sec. I promise I'll sure. be two seconds. Sure. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, before we leave the metals, let's talk about a dark horse. And the dark okay. horse, as far as I can see, is platinum because it's about a grand. It's uh, doubled from the lows 52 weeks ago of 550. Still looks very discounty to palladium and certainly mm -hmm. looks very discounty to gold. So um, is this a dark horse that could uh, surprise people because of the supplies being uh, much tighter than the uh, sure. gold? Uh, and, the, and of course, it's a thin market. We mm -hmm. see what happens, um, you know, when you have thin markets and you have volume come in, the prices can right. get exciting, right? <laughs> they, they definitely can. Mm -hmm. You're right. Not too many people are trading. Uh, not crowded. Yeah, no, it's absolutely not crowded. Um, honestly, I mean, I don't have a strong opinion in it, and the, mostly because the options are absolutely untradeable. So I really just don't even pay as much attention to it. I'm more of an option person than a futures person, but I definitely right. think you it can, uh, it is ripe for some surprises just because of the mechanics in the market. I think you're absolutely right there. How about, uh, how big is the contract? Is it still 50 ounce and uh, what's the margin? Uh, it is, and let me see what the margin is. I haven't looked at that one in a little while. So platinum margin is only 3,600, which is kind of surprising mm -hmm. to me. I expected it to be a little higher. If we click on this and see what the CME has to say, it's uh, 50 troy ounces is still there. You're right. Mm -hmm. um, so basically it's you make or lose $50 per dollar in platinum. Mm -hmm. It's half of what you would in gold. Mm -hmm. We do have a handful of clients to trade it, but it's, I've, it's kind of a feast or famine yeah. type of deal yeah. so uh, yeah be, you know just proceed with caution if you do yeah, it's to go, very go volatile yeah. uh, the volume is eight thousand contracts is. versus a gold at one hundred and sixty seven thousand. so that tells you that it's a thin market palladium is even worse though it's 1793 volume today so right yeah um all right let's go over those grains uh, you know um i think we all uh, got a pretty good idea that um eight nine ten was the breakout mm -hmm. and then we ran way up here towards 15 and then they pulled the rug out and now it's back on the bicycle. What's happening with like soybeans? Let's start out with them. Okay. All right. So this is, um, well, all right. So we actually thought soybeans were going to run out of steam somewhere here around 12 and that, that was yeah. not the case. No. They just kept going. Luckily we, we had just bought, we had like some, um, We'd purchased puts and then we sold puts against it on the sell-off. And so we didn't get hurt too badly, but it, it definitely wasn't a necessarily pleasant experience. And we missed out on all this fun. So that's good. I mean, that's not good. We did have, at one point, we had a 
bull call spread that did pretty well in it, but we just underestimated the, the run. So anyway, now that we're here, uh, we're in a pretty interesting time in soybeans. I, I wouldn't be a buyer here. I think that this, these prices are starting to get really lofty, but um, the thing about the grains are once they start going, it's really hard to turn them around. So if, you, if you're gonna play the upside, you're gonna have a hard time doing it with call options. This might be a market that you might wanna look at the mini contracts because soybeans are having, they're swinging pretty big. So for example, today we were up like 30 cents, 26. So if you were trading a full size contract in soybeans, you would have made or lost $1,300 on one contract. Um, that's gonna be a pretty wild position for anyone because we've seen that it's moved. I mean, there was a few days in a row where we had 30, 40 cent days, three or four consecutive. Mm -hmm. So that's nice six, if you're on the right six, side. I think it was a 60 cent day the other day too. Yeah. If you're on the right side of it, awesome. That's great. But if, you, if you're not, that's not so fun. But there is a mini contract that's one tenth the size. So instead of making or losing um, $1,500, you're making or losing couple hundred dollars a day. And so it's just a little more manageable. And like you mentioned before, you can dollar cost average and do that sort of thing. Uh, if you are going to play the downside, probably just do it with, with put options. I mean, it, it, someday it will pay off when, I don't know, probably when everybody gives up is when that's going to happen. And the premiums um, are big. So you'd probably want to look at put spreads, right? You could do put spreads. Yeah. You know what the, the puts, they're not as expensive as you might think. Oh. Um, let me just pull I would think they'd here. be pretty heavy uh, going like it's been. Yeah. I mean, they're not, they're definitely not cheap. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know why my. Weird. Uh, they must, this server must be down on those options for some reason. Sorry. Because the markets are closed. You know, really. Yeah. Usually yeah. I can pull them up on, I can pull up the settlements, but for some reason it's not letting me, but anyway. Um, you want to, yeah, you want to go over the corn and, uh, and yeah. uh, wheat? Uh, they're pretty sure. much uh, running in tandem, but uh, mm -hmm. obviously at different speeds. They are. So um, these are all old stuff going on here. You get so a feeling is, like it's like a little bit like gold at 2100 though. Is it uh, a little bit like that? I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've seen, let me pull up a monthly chart of corn. This is a monthly chart of corn. So I'm not convinced we're in that commodity super cycle that people are talking about. Maybe right. we are, but the corn rallies really have had a hard time holding. I mean, we can see that this is, uh, the last time we had one that sustained itself was 2010. So, and even then eventually it gave it all back. So you can see this is a very telling chart. Commodities are not stocks. They don't just always go up all the time. In fact, commodities almost always go down or sideways. And that's because it can tango, like the difference between um, the current price of a commodity and the distant price due to storage and those sorts of things. So commodities generally have a sideways to downward bias, not an up bias, at least agricultural commodities do. And so this kind of lays that out for you. But um, I wouldn't sell corn futures by any means, just simply because that's probably an accident waiting to happen. But um, well, it is I mean, a freight train and there could be situations behind the curtain course. on supply that you're not aware yes. of or China having to buy something that we're exactly. not aware of or something like that. Well, a lot of this big run is exactly that. China unexpectedly, you know, they said they were going to buy and then they never did. And then suddenly they decided, well, let's buy. And so it just kind of forced everything up suddenly. Um, but grains, it's really a tough game to chase grain rallies. The call mm -hmm. options are wildly overpriced. So you could maybe put together a decent bull call spread if you want to play the upside. But trying to buy futures up here is a really dangerous game. I mean, you can see, imagine if you bought at 730, um, just to give you an idea of what that, I'm, hopefully nobody bought the highs, but I'm sure someone did. But uh, this is a $23,000 move from high to low in just a couple yeah. of months. So 
it, do you watch the Elliot? Uh, do you listen to the Elliot Wave stuff at all, and or uh, listen? You know, do, do you put uh, credence into it? Because some of these guys are saying that the first half of this year is going to be rough on the commodities. They're going to give back mm -hmm. a lot of these gains, and uh -huh. then in the second half of the year, they're going to get on the bicycle because the inflationary numbers are going to pick up and uh, whatever. Um, you know, I haven't seen a lot of that type of chatter, but I kind of like that idea. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that sounds good to me. I think everything is just so overheated right now. I'm hesitant right. to to try to be bullish in a market that's ran this this hot for so long. But um, here's a look at uh, the commo Bloomberg Commodity Index, just to kind of give you an idea mm -hmm. of where we are on the scale. So this is a, a daily chart. You've, you can see we're trading in a range. And even after all this craziness and the grains and crude oil moving up and all that, we're still actually um, relatively tame if you look at the complex as, as a whole, which I think is interesting. I think we're going to probably pull back and see some lower prices in this index and then uh, maybe later in the year get, get another run up. So that would kind of coincide with those Elliott Wave ideas. I'm not sure we, you know, we're using completely, completely different analysis to get to that right? yeah right. to get to that but i think that sounds reasonable to me i just think everything's too hot but if we get a pullback i think it's a really great time to start looking at the upside in some of these commodities mm -hmm. just to put this in perspective i'll pull up a <laughs> monthly chart of the bloomberg commodity index this high here around 230 240 was when crude oil was at 150. This index does a pretty good job at diversifying between, I think there's like 22 commodities in it and they try to mm. prevent crude oil from being too heavily weighted, mm. but it still does follow crude oil pretty closely. But you can see even after this big run up, we're still, the index itself is actually still pretty cheap, but we've come a long way. This, it started at 60 in March. Mm. Now we're trading at about 80. That's a pretty good jump for, for something like this. Let's try to hit. <clears throat> let's try to hit three markets real quick before we sign out. The first one okay. would be crude oil. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Your thoughts were uh, the fifty-two to fifty-four area is a little frothy. I do think that I. Um, Temporarily, anyway. We've yeah. I mean, I'm not. I don't think crude oil is going to completely fall apart, and we certainly aren't going to see what we saw earlier last year. But I do think the interesting thing about crude oil is several years ago when I first started in this business, the risk was to the upside. Crude oil moved up faster than it moved down. But in the last couple of years, well, the last several years, we'll say it's been the opposite. Crude oil actually moves down faster than it moves up, which is really odd. Most commodities don't do that. But I think that has a lot to do with uh, U.S. shale and fracking and the oversupplies and all that kind of stuff. But that might be you know, as we go into this new administration, that that might be something that we don't see anymore. It might be the risk to the upside. So long, bigger picture, I think crude oil probably does see 60s, 70s. I don't, but for now, like when the next handful of months, I think crude oil is really going to have a hard time breaking 55. We've come from $10. So I mean, it's, it's just due yeah. for, for some consolidation. And, and it's not just that. Obviously, the trend is up. But if you look at the COT report, speculators are starting to get a little aggressively long. And every time that happens, it, the market tends to go through a correction. Um, also, if the dollar moves higher, like I think it might, that's going to really put a damper on crude oil. So Those I would think be a couple we all reasons 55. to be a little, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but longer term, looking pretty good. Yeah, <clears throat> correct. I've noticed um, uh, the energy shares because uh, I had a good run in them and I blew them out and uh, mm. they definitely have been losing altitude. Yeah, uh, same here. I mean, I, I'm not uh, an expert in stocks by any means, but I no. did peel off a lot of my energy holdings in my retirement accounts just because yeah. I agree with you. It just seems we've had a really nice run. No, re no reason to get greedy. Let's see what happens. Right. Okay, let's switch over to the uh, US dollar. Okay which is uh, something that, uh, you know, people are talking about overcrowded negativity. There's a lot of that going on. There is. So this is kind of the, the same ballpark that we've seen in some of the other markets. So like in stocks, everybody's overly giddy. And in the dollar, every, I really um, have yet to, I can't think of five people out of the hundreds that I communicate with in the last couple of weeks that think the dollar might actually go up. So that it's just such an overcrowded sentiment. Like even the, I mean, people at my gym 
when I go to take gym classes, they're talking about the weak dollar, so stocks have to go up. And it, when I hear things like that from people that have never followed the markets before, it makes me a little nervous. So not just that though. We, if you look at the COT report again, every, a lot of people are pretty heavily short the dollar and I think they've just gotten too comfortable. And so mm -hmm. when that happens, um, things tend to turn around. Now that with that said, it's entirely possible we test 88 here first before it really turns around. I mean, bottoming is a, a process, not an event usually, although in March it was more of a, an event. It happened in a few minutes and that was it. But um, I think it, it might take some time, but I do think 88, 90 ish area holds and we go right back up. And if that, if that happens, it's really going to deflate a lot of the commodities and stocks. Let's uh, talk a little bit about um, the uh, bonds. Okay. Um, so I tend to be... They're pretty negative on bonds out there too. Same, same idea. And uh, bonds on the dollar have been pretty positively correlated. So they're probably going to move in the same direction. I tend to think that bonds move higher. Again, most people are bearish bonds that you know, time will tell, maybe they're right. But this, this feels like a lot like what we saw last year, the circle here in the middle of the screen, that's, that was the pattern last year. And it was kind of the same thing. Uh, the stock market was running, roaring, everybody thought everything was great. And interest rates were definitely, definitely, definitely going up finally. And that was it. Treasuries were going to sell off. And then next thing you know, the exact opposite happened. This feels like almost the same pattern. It's a little longer. But we seem to be holding this support here. And as long as that continues, I think we go right back up. I wouldn't be shocked to see 142 in the 10-year note, maybe even 145 if things get a little hairy. Um, just to put that in perspective, 145 in the 10-year note futures probably means pretty close to zero interest rates. I mean, at least under half a percent. So I'd hate to see that from, from a personal standpoint, because I don't think that's really the direction we want to go with everything, but I think it probably will happen. It's happened overseas everywhere else. Why not here? So. Yeah. A lot of the markets, they're tough to uh, stand in front of because with that $1.9 trillion stimulus package, right. um, that's an awful lot of liquidity they're talking about. And uh, uh, heavy liquidity has been pretty good for asset prices. So that's what makes it kind of uh, Right. To, you know, and that's probably one of the reasons why many of these things haven't really cracked yet. You know, the stocks haven't cracked. The gold hasn't really cracked. Oil mm -hmm. hasn't really cracked because uh, they're holding out um, uh, hope on that liquidity thing that the liquidity mm -hmm. will just make it keep going anyway. It's possible. Uh, I, yeah, I agree with you. And I mean, I remember uh, quantity, the quantitative easing cycles like in 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. it, basically, everything went up. Fundamentals didn't matter. Charts didn't matter. It just all... Mm -hmm. It just all went up. And I think the interesting thing about this cycle is we're obviously getting a lot of that in stocks and commodities. But for some reason, um, every time you mention stimulus, the treasury market sells off a little bit. But it, a decade ago, it was the exact opposite when you mentioned stimulus and treasuries went up. So I think it's interesting how the market's reacting a little differently. And I think that'll actually change. I think eventually uh, people will realize that treasuries can and will go up with stimulus. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. All right. We're at the top of the hour, Carly. So um, let people know again, how to get a hold of you. And again, whether you're just starting out or you have experience, uh, you handle both type of investors. Plus you also handle the self-directed. So just explain briefly, you know, how they can uh, uh, get together with you. Correct. So this is our website, decarlytrading.com. We have, <clears throat> honestly, most of our <clears throat> clients are self-directed online traders. We give <clears throat> them research and ideas and that sort of thing, but they're, they're, uh, making their own decisions. They, we give them a platform, so, but we do offer broker assisted and full service and that sort of thing. So we offer everything in between. But if you want to just learn about trading commodities, if you're not familiar with it, you can visit our website. There's information on our books. There's about 40 free videos. And um, if you want to get a hold of us, there's a chat window on the website, or you can email me at cgarner at decarlytrading.com. Okay, that's great. Uh, for optionprofessor.com, we have a weekly market update that we send out every Friday. To get that, you go to optionprofessor.com and put your email in the queue. And then next Friday, you'll be getting the free update uh, that goes out every week. Right now, I'm going to turn it back over to David. Carly, thank you very much for being with thank us. You. I think we yep. gave them plenty of information out there. So hopefully people can call you and find out more. Thank you. 
All right, thanks. Yeah, a lot of good topics covered today. So just a quick reminder for everyone, be sure to subscribe to Timing Research on YouTube and your favorite podcast app or directory. Uh, and you can also go to timingresearch.com to get access to any of the past events there, as well as uh, this one, as soon as I can get it posted today. And I uh, just want to thank, thank uh, Carly Gardner of dcarlytrading.com for being here today and uh, the option prof professor of optionprofessor.com for moderating. And uh, thanks everyone. Thanks.